My name is Gabe. I'm an SRE for Google and have been for a bit over 14 years now. In that time, I've seen Google grow both into and then back out of three generations of monitoring systems. In uh, this talk today, well, what am I going to talk, uh, talk about? So uh, the first question is always, what problem are we trying to solve? Uh, so we'll start with a couple of definitions and uh, some requirements. Then, because in any talk, I always like to have a concrete example that I'm talking about, so we'll introduce the Hello World web service. And uh, the majority of the talk will be spending answering uh, what data this, this service should be exporting so that we get the most value from whichever monitoring system we happen to actually be using. So first up, definitions. The title of the talk is Instrumentation for Observability. There already have been at this event and others many talks about what observability means. So I'll just summarize the core point, which is data is not the same thing as information. Our monitoring system allows us to collect data, and then our monitoring system allows us to derive data from that. So for example, we collect data of like a position of a car at different timestamps. And that is data that our monitoring system directly collects. And then uh, we derive data from it. We take the rate. Uh, so that's the speed, of course. So now we have the average speed over those intervals. Uh, we can derive more data from that by, again, taking the rate. And that gives us acceleration data. And all of this is straightforward. All of these are kind of the hello world examples of monitoring. Uh, to stick with this level of example to export this kind of data, and I said practical, if you use Prometheus, you just set a gauge value to your current position. If you use um, Honeycomb, if you're not familiar with Honeycomb, it's a third party uh, monitoring service provider. Uh, you just report events to them, so you just report to them, I am here now. This is data, we're just collecting data here. Now what is information? Observability means that we can then interpret the data or the derived data and then get actual information from it. So if we, we usually start by graphing our data. Um, the y-axis here is unitless, just the numbers line up beautifully. The uh, blue line, does this work? Yes, the blue line, that's the data that we collected, that's the position over time. The red line is the speed in meters per second now to get the same numbers. And uh, the yellow line is the acceleration data. So uh, this is now something that we can start interpreting. For example, we identify, hey, the speed crosses 100 kilometers an hour in under three seconds. We have information, it's a fast car. Okay, so that's, that, that's the definition we're going, to do, we're going to work with. We want to export good data so that we can derive useful information about the service. This is our requirement. We should have some monitoring. Now, that's, that's not phrased as a question, but nevertheless, there is a correct answer, and the correct answer is not yes. The correct answer is why, which is a flippant way of saying, well, for what specific purpose are we going to have this monitoring? So there's... There's a couple of questions that you might answer. So the three most important ones I find, uh, whoops. First, we want to know, does it work, whatever service we're providing? So we need to define what it works even means. This is your SLO, this is your service level objective. Uh, we have questions such as, how many clients can we support for our service? This is necessary for your scaling issues and your capacity planning and so on. And then of course, as SREs, we always have the question, what just happened? And then they immediately followed by, how did that happen? So this is for debugging, which is related, but a different question. Note that we need to alert is not a reason for monitoring. It's technically correct that you need monitoring so that you can have alerting, but the alerting also needs to answer why are we alerting, what are we alerting for? The answer is usually because it broke, but again, the, 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 the underlying question is, is it working? Okay, the Hello World Service. Say hello to the Hello World Service. It's a lovingly over-engineered trivial service. A client asks the service to say hello and says the name that it wishes to greet and the locale. Uh, the greeter service then goes to the translation backend to fetch the translation for what it is trying to say. Uh, the translator responds with the localized version of the string pattern, and then the greeter uses that to respond to the client. Uh, 
The reason that I use this example in basically all of my talks is that it is our loving example of everything is a stack. The uh, translator will have some kind of database to store, so it has its own backends and so on. The point is that queries come in, uh, requests go out, those responses come in, and your responses go back. This pattern applies everywhere. We'll focus on the greeter here in this uh, talk and start with our SLOs. So we'll make up some SLOs and then figure out how to measure them. These are the SLIs, the service level indicators. First, we want a 99% availability. So to figure out our availability, we need to have the number of responses we sent for the number of requests we got. That's great. We have a latency target that says that 95% of responses should be delivered in under 100 milliseconds. So we need to measure how many responses we delivered in under 100 milliseconds and the number of requests we got. And then finally, the business also has a quality metric because we also want to know whether it works well. And uh, for this service, we just say that all languages that are requested should have at least one candidate. So we need the number of results we had by the number of requests. But now I have so many questions about this. So in availability, what happens with partial success? Is there such a thing? Uh, for some of these questions, see also the talk on Friday by my colleague about yes, no, maybe. There's a large amount of maybe in all of our services. Um, other questions we have in availability are, what if the, if the query was invalid? What if it asked for a language that doesn't even exist? Is that my problem? Um, speaking of language, de define language, right? And we use the full locale string. What if there's, they're asking for the version of Spanish that is spoken in China? I might not have that combination of language and territory. Does that make sense? I don't know. Our latency measurement. What about, well, do we care about the other 5% that are allowed to be slower? Do we care about managing that tail or do we not? Or do we just say, well, it was too slow, it doesn't matter. Um, if we're returning errors, does the speed at which we return errors count for our latency SLO or not? I don't know. So, with all of these questions not yet answered, or not answered because I'm not the business, um, metrics that we frequently see for measuring this kind of the, the, these, these kinds of SLOs are going to have the shape of requests and responses and errors and timeouts and some measure of slow requests and some measure of very slow requests. And now I have so many more questions. Are timeouts not errors? Or are they just a subset of errors? What about bad requests? I don't see bad requests here. Are they just errors? Um, do, if, I, if I sum up the responses and the errors and the timeouts, do I come up with the same number as requests? And if not, what's, where are the other ones gone? Speaking of timeouts, what timed out? Were we too slow to, response, to respond or did our backend timeout? What are we actually measuring here? These are not great metrics. We see them all the time. We see them in documentation for monitoring systems, how to export these metrics. Please do not use these metrics. For measuring availability, the first big thing is do not distinguish between a request and a response. An error is just a different kind of response. The total number of requests that you got is the total number of responses you would have sent. The total is the sum of the parts. Right? So we measure, we say we had this request, this number of requests had a status of okay, this number of requests had a status of an invalid argument, that's a client side error, uh, but we care. We have this number of requests where we, got, where we returned resource exhausted. Maybe we were out of quota of the translation backend or the user was out of quota for the translation backend. Uh, maybe the user, the user did not have permission, so we'll have an unauthorized error in there. And then we sum all of those up, and that's the total number of requests we got. This is the monitoring equivalent of self-documenting variables. And for people who aren't familiar with that particular notation, this is the uh, text format that Prometheus or Google's Borgmon engine use for uh, transporting the data. It's basically just a map. We do the same thing on our outbound requests, where we say, well, I sent these things, and then I got these in status OK. Uh, we, it is possible to send more requests to a backend than that backend ever receives, of course, because the backend may have completely disappeared. If, if the PSU blows, we're not going to get the monitoring data from it. Uh, so we'll have some number of requests we sent where we never heard back. This is our deadline exceeded, where we just decided, well, that's a timeout of the backend. Once we have this kind of breakdown, the lovely thing that we can do with this 
is we can then do partial sums. We can say, well, all of the client, client errors together, green line up there, almost 10%. That's a lot of errors, but they're not my problem. Right? This is not an availability SLO problem. Um, we have some number of internal errors, and that's, down, that's the blue line at around 3%. And that's maybe some kind of problem. But what's really interesting is if we look at just the resource exhausted errors, that tracks our request shape a lot. So maybe at around like 19,000, 20,000 requests per second, the y-axis does not start at zero. Um, maybe somewhere there is where we're hitting our, uh, our limits. And maybe we have a scaling problem here. So suddenly we actually have information from this data. And this data was not harder to export. But the breakout is important. That yellow line there would have quite possibly, if we just add all of these errors uh, together into the errors counter, that would have probably been lost in the noise floor. Instrumenting this is not a lot harder. Turns out in Prometheus, well, now all you have is basically a map where you say, well, actually, now the status was this. Please count that. Don't just count the request. Count this kind of request. In Honeycomb, again, because they uh, transport events, you just say, well, this event had this status. And because this is Go, the error might be null, so you have to test that separately. Still easy, really, really easy instrumentation, but much higher fidelity data. So this brings us to our guideline one. The guideline one is the whole is the sum of its parts, which basically means the other way around. Whenever you're tempted to export a total, don't export the total. Export all of the fractions by category or by flavor or whatever the correct term is for the, uh, for the value you're exporting. And then the total is implicit in the sum of those. It also has the advantage that you never accidentally increment the error counter, then collect your data, and then divide it by the request counter and have 200% and have error rate, which fairness is probably an anomaly. Our second SLO was to do with latency. Measuring latency, there's the, the typical things. Obviously, we need the number of requests. We had the slow requests. We had the very slow requests. We usually see some kind of cumulative latency counter. And again, I have questions. So the slow requests, were they still within SLO, or were they the ones, were they the ones that were already out of SLO? Can't obviously tell from, from these names. Um, the latency millisecond total uh, count, we can divide that. We can take the rate of that and divide it by the request rate. And then we'll have an average, well, specifically, we'll have a mean latency. But is that actually useful? It's not useful. As Eugen pointed out, latency is generally not a normal distribution. So again, you'll find these metrics everywhere. I find them in all of our code and a lot of our documentation, and they are terrible. Please do not use these metrics. Use histograms. So as Eugen showed with the histogram use, you very quickly see whether something is or what the distribution is like. Uh, in our example, because we had 100 millisecond um, SLO, we're going in 20 millisecond buckets up to 160. And then after 160, we say, well, then this is the infinity thing. This took more than 100 milliseconds. I don't really care how long it took. Something's really wrong. Just sum, sum all of this together. This was probably our very slow queries from earlier, or maybe not. But now I have an actual number to stick, with, uh, to stick there. What we can do with these exports is we can get a histogram uh, from them. And this tells us a story um, that this is great. Everything is down in the sort of 20 to 40 millisecond area, then a little bit up to 60. Um, then, and because we're summing everything after 160, that uh, bar on the right hand is slightly higher. <coughs> the problem with histograms is that they're very difficult to look at over time. You end up with something like that. Um, and this is difficult to pass if you try to animate this over history. However, we do see that well, there, there's that sort of occasional blip on the right-hand side there where something's happening with our latency. Now that, something's clearly going on, and the distribution is uh, clearly interesting. This is my favorite kind of graph. It is the heat map. It's basically a, a histogram viewed from the top. So what was on the left is now on the bottom. Time goes right, and you show the elevation of the points by, by shade or by color, whatever. What we see here is literally the same data we had just had in the animated GIF. Uh, but we, can, we see that somewhere around the uh, 17 time unit mark, uh, something went wrong. So a, lot of, a bunch of queries went from the fast sets down at the bottom all the way to the top to the really slow, uh, to the really slow set. That's outside SLO. This is relevant. Heat maps are my favorite kind of graph. But most importantly, export the distribution data. 
guideline two. Latency is not a normal distribution. Even when it normally is, the time you care about it is when suddenly something happens to that distribution that makes it not normal anymore, and at that point your mean is no longer a useful measure. It is no longer me not a meaningful number for anything other than a normal distribution. So whenever you're exporting the concept of how long did it take, prefer a histogram. I say usually because it might not actually be important for your use case, but at that point, why are you exporting it at all? A little bit more on monitoring latency, however, we don't just have end-to-end -end latency, we have different things that take amounts of times, and our greeter example, the greeter does some local processing and then it spends some time waiting for its backends, and we may want to measure those things separately. At this point, we're not really talking about SLO, we're talking about debugging the service, like why did it take so long, now this went slower, where did the time go? So uh, we want the higher resolution uh, uh, latency buckets. And then obviously we need to uh, classify this by where the latency came from. <coughs> Going back to the, well, using the same data that we just had, the black line is overlaying a traffic curve. Uh, the local latency, what we exported as local, that looks great. I mean, when the traffic curve goes above, uh, above about 75,000 uh, queries per second, somewhere here, um, this shade goes slightly darker. So we're slowly moving into the tail, so maybe Let's hope this was a low test. So maybe we should be talking to either the business unit about what their growth plans are or uh, figure out what capacity planning we need to do for that. This is lovely. The green line there, that's the mean value. Note that the mean value is not actually really interesting. It does not tell us anything about that tail, uh, tail slowly going up. And then when we zoom in on the translator backend, oops. Uh, so the black line is the same, uh, same traffic curve. The green line is still the mean. But something clearly happens. So the, the tail goes out at about 50,000 uh, requests per second. So we can't wait until we hit 75,000 before we need to start considering this. Uh, because clearly we are, start, we are putting different load on the translation backend. We need to plan for that. And when we hit 75,000 queries per second, we're actually already in a very different situation. Latency falls off a cliff. Well, hits a cliff. Uh, we have that big red block up in the, uh, in the top right, which basically means we have, suddenly have a significant amount of requests taking, 100, taking uh, over 100 milliseconds. And uh, right at the bottom, we have a, a, some number of uh, requests that is now taking less than five milliseconds, which is unusual. <laughs> That's probably some kind of degraded processing or errors are fast to respond or something like that. But either way, the important thing is that green line there. That does not tell us anything interesting at all. That's the mean. And at the point where the latency became really interesting, that measure, metric became really useless. The mean line is data but at this point it gives us no information whatsoever. Exporting this data, still the same. Uh, Prometheus supports hist histograms as an exported thing. You just tell it what latency buckets you care about, and then you don't say set or you don't say increment, but you just say observe, this happened. And in Honeycomb, it's even less code uh, than that. Uh, you just say how long this took and add it to the event you're sending for your request, and then they'll do the bucketization for you. This is still easy. So, guideline three. The parts are important as the totals. We were looking at the local portion and the remote portion. Latency has contributing factors and you need to measure all of them. This is for debugging, less for SLOs. One caveat, these two latency histograms for the local and the remote uh, portion, you can't add them. Uh, if you add them up, then uh, you imply that you're getting double the request. We're double counting each request, and these numbers in this histogram mean nothing at all. You can't add these just because they were in the same map in this case. Doesn't mean that they are fractions of our own. Handle this with care. So guideline four, the guidelines don't actually conflict. You do sometimes need to export the latency, the total latency in this case, separately from the fractions because they're not fractions. You're, you'd otherwise be uh, double counting. These are not rules. You need to consider your situation and do the, well, a, a me measure the thing that you care about. <coughs> measure all of the things you care about. Which brings us to our, to, to, to our last SLO and the quality metric. To me the 
SLO was that we need at least one translation per, per language. So the, the natural thing that we would usually do or that we see everywhere is that we know how many requests we sent and we know how many responses we get and got and then we divide one by the other and we have a useless number. Well, technically we have a mean, but we can't use it for anything. So I don't do that either. Uh, this is where we get our multidimensional uh, histogram label, uh, label combination. Uh, this is just a multidimensional map. The last map key happens to be a latency bucket. Uh, in this case, we expect up to maybe five translations. We def definitely care about zero uh, in this example because we really only care about zero or not zero. But while we're at it, we'll just collect a couple of, uh, of them. We have the distribution information. And in this case, because every request maps to exactly one bucket, uh, this is a lovely example of, the, of the, the, the total being the sum of the parts again, uh, because any subset of these will provide useful information. You can either uh, sum across all of the languages and territories. That was the SLO uh, that we got from the business side of things. Or we can break this out by language. We can say, well, for everything that only had zero, which languages were relevant, and so on. And this gives you the high fidelity data to extract that information to figure out where the problem is. This is one single logical export, but show all of the fractions. And it's still easy. Right? So in the Prometheus term, you just add Prometheus calls it labels. These are just the extra map keys. Um, in Honeycomb, it's the same thing. You just add the different fields uh, to your event, and then it will keep that correlation for you. The actual instrumentation is really, really easy for all of these systems, and it is easy for all other systems as well. The point is guideline zero, the probably most important guideline of all of them. What's gone is gone. Any data reduction you have performed at the source is not recoverable. You can't get the data back. You can't get information from data you don't have. The nature of data exporting, the nature of our instrumentation is that you're discarding information. Because otherwise you would try to like log everything that happened and that's too much, you can't do that. Don't remove too much however. Like if you export just a running total, it's like exporting a histogram with only one bucket labeled everything. Try more buckets. If you're only exporting success and failure metrics, like your error count, that's a single bit of information, and maybe you want to export a few more bits. Right? Keep, the error, uh, keep the status around, the error code. While you're doing this, take the opportunity uh, to show the processing stages. This was the latency for local and, repo uh, and remote part in the example. The, this dovetails with tracing. Tracing solves a slightly different problem. Tracing gives you a lot richer information than uh, these data samples. These data samples, however, you get for every single request. If you try to trace every request, that's probably going to be too expensive. You're probably paying too much performance cost for that. Uh, so, the, so these go together, but do provide the data as well. Right. So our guidelines. Guideline zero. What's gone is gone. Do not throw data away too early. You can always ignore it. Guideline one, the whole is the sum of its parts. Export fractions, export by category, export by flavor, and then treat the total as a derived value just as you derive the rate after the fact. Guideline two, latency is not a normal distribution. And this is probably the most important one because everybody always measures mean latencies and that is never useful. But neither is any other distribution usually, uh, usually normal. In our example, it was the number of translations you, uh, you've had. You've probably got some number of zeros. You've probably got a large number of ones. And then anything else is probably also strange. Most of the distributions that you will encounter are not normal. And certainly by the time they're interesting to us as SREs, they are no longer normal. Guideline three, the parts are just as important as the totals especially when they're not fractions. When they are fractions, you need them, but when they're not fractions, they provide information that you can't get otherwise. And then guideline four, these are not rules. Maybe a full histogram at the resolution that you really care about, keyed by all of the fractions you care about, would be too big for your, uh, for your monitoring system. Maybe gathering all of this information is too expensive for the, high, for the high performance, high frequency service you're running. These are guidelines, these are not rules. But when you're looking at your code instrumentation, Consider these guidelines, and please do not just export running totals. Right. 
And this is my spiel here. Do we have questions? Yeah, it was quite informative. Thanks for that. And a quick question on latency. Uh, sure. Considering that uh, you showed up a hello service, let's consider the client is outside our scope. Uh, let's take the Google Maps example. Say the client is a food delivery app, Uber Eats probably, and then probably it's a Fitbit app. So they're out of our scope. How do we define, how do we identify the observability uh, on, say, Uber may need uh, data quite, uh, you know, immediately, instantaneously, but probably a Fitbit may need it, um, you know, not so regularly or instantaneously. How do we identify that there's a real latency at the client level? Because every client needs it in a different way. So from the, from the instrumentation point of view, uh, you have different kinds of clients, if you can identify them on your server side, and then they basically become different map keys um, in, in, the, in, this, in, in, this, in this lingo here. Uh, so you basically say, well, sort of my, my, my real-time uh, business clients, this was the latency histogram for them, this was my near-time ones, and this was the best effort, wider public, no API key, whatever. Right? Um, and you can export these separately. Uh, and generally using different maps for that would be the, the, sure. the approach. From a measurement perspective, obviously you can't run software on somebody's Fitbit. Yeah. Uh, what we do on our web services uh, for that is the time to first byte, so when we start responding, because that gets past the entire uh, part that we don't control. We don't control the network, we don't control the, the wireless latency to their device, but we know the difference between we have started receiving the request and we have started sending the reply. That's as good as it gets usually short of then running your own probers that sort of simulate uh, client behavior outside. If you're running a web, if you're running a mobile app, of course you can instrument that directly and then report that back as right. a kind of near time statistics, but that's as good as this will get. Yeah, the reason I ask is you'd have to uh, probably customize your uh, responses to those clients specifically, unless you have an SLO with them to start off when you have the transaction starting off, uh, when you agree to mm -hmm. you know, share the API. Um, I, I was just wondering if Google has another way of doing it. Yeah. Uh, it's a bit tricky because it's it, it, so again it depends on what, what what you're trying to measure so basically as a service provider you'd say uh, you'd, you'd do your yep. agreement with them probably on the time to first byte level because that's the part that is actually in your control sure and, but this is the difference between the, your SLO and your SLA uh, you always have an SLO even when you don't actually have an agreement because you have some kind of business objective for, for, for define it works right because sending the results by post in six weeks for your search query is not really working, even though you could implement it that way. <laughs> but you have some kind of business objective, so you have some kind of objective that you, that you have, even if uh, you don't necessarily support all clients. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. One more yep. Hello. Yes, uh, for one of our services, uh, we recently switched to uh, latency-based histograms. Mm -hmm. uh, the now the problem is the uh, monitoring alerting is not obvious anymore. Like if mm -hmm. it was uh, like just the latency data points, um, obvious choice would be 95 percentile latency or 99 mm -hmm. percentile latency. But now that you have bucketing, all you have is number. Like these many requests are taking more than one mm -hmm. second. Mm -hmm. So what? How how would you approach monitoring in that case? Because we don't have percentile anymore. We have absolute numbers mm -hmm. that these many requests are in this bucket. Mm -hmm. So what? What? How would you approach monitoring in that case? Well, you can still get from the from the um, histogram to the to the um, alerting to, to, to the percentiles, right? Um, you know what distribution you have based on the absolute uh, numbers per bucket, um, and uh, from that you can calculate your uh, where your percentiles are. Obviously, quantize to the bucket boundaries, right? So you need to choose your bucket boundaries so that they make sense for what you're trying to achieve. Um, the 20 millisecond buckets up to 100 milliseconds, that doesn't not go, that's not going to tell you the difference between your 90th and 95th percentile, because it's all going to be in the same bucket. Uh, so the bucketization is sort of its own art, uh, but usually driven by straightforward considerations uh, such as, well, I have 95%, 95th percentile at 100 milliseconds. So I need to be able to identify my 100 milliseconds uh, well enough to identify whether I'm over or under that. Right? Because at that point you say, well, okay, I have a 100 millisecond bucket, and based on the request over the interval that I care about, uh, more than 95 out of 100 were in buckets to the left of that. Right? So more sort of like uh, you uh, go back, take a look, what is the distribution, and then you decide the, uh, uh, the alerting threshold, basically. 
Yeah. No. Uh, first, you set your objective on how fast does this need to be. Uh, then you choose your uh, histogram bucketization so that you can identify whether that's working. And then for the purposes of actually alerting a human, um, at that point, you're in, a, uh, in the multidimensional trade-off between, well, what is this cost? What is the opportunity cost? What is the uh, human actually going to do? Um, how long does it need to be bad for me to page somebody? My uh, objective is probably something like quarterly, 95th percentile, but I have to page after five minutes, so what am I going to do there? So this is, becomes a slightly more complicated calculus. Uh, but you start with your objective first and say, what do I need to deliver? And then you measure so you can identify whether you're doing that. And then after that, that's where you quantify your alerts. All right, good. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much.